Today is February the 20th, 2023, and we are in the midst of what we have called the Fundamental Doctrines series. This evening, we are going to follow up on last session's discussion of joy with a discussion of peace, and we are coming from the perspective or from the stance that Romans 14, 17, as we read, says that the kingdom is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we're going to touch on the components. Last week was joy, this week is peace. So I'm calling this peace, the pause that refreshes. I know that I'm snatching probably from somebody's patented trademarked uh, fast food or soft drink commercial. But as I thought about what peace is, and I thought about being in a situation where one can pause or stop in order to contemplate, in order to gather oneself, um, peace is a very important part of that. And so there is a refreshing that happens when one can be at peace, hence this title, Peace, the Pause that Refreshes. Now, according to Ephesians 6, it says as part of the armor of God that we are to have our feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace, I think is exactly how Paul put it. And so we're going to talk about that a bit this evening. Um, Romans 5.1 says that we have peace with God. Jesus instructed his disciples that when they come into a place, they are to give the people their peace. And then he also promised us that his peace he would leave with us. But how do we get that? How do we get it and how do we walk in it? Let's be more specific. Pastor Matt Slick put it this way. The peace shoes that God supplies have two purposes, <clears throat> defensive and offensive. In order to defend ourselves against the flaming arrows of the evil one, we must have confidence of our position in Christ. We must stand firm in the truth of God's word, regardless of how terrifying the circumstances may be. That's 1 John 5, 14. We must understand grace without abusing it. That's Romans 6, 1 to 6. We must remember that our position in Christ is not based on our own abilities or our own worthiness, Titus 3, 5. And we must keep the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness securely fastened, 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. I'm letting Danny join. There he is. So we're going to start reading, we're going to read a lot of scripture this evening because it's times like these, and I think most times it is always better to let the word of God speak for itself. First Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. Okay, I know the slide says, Corinthians, forgive me, that there should be a number there. <laughs> okay, so we are going to read First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 4, that's up on the screen. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Notice how many times the word all is used here. If everybody is doing something, whatever the thing is, if all the people are doing something, ideally all means unity. It means oneness. It means lack of competition. It means equality. And when you have all of those components together, you have peace. The writer says that the fathers all were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses. They all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You already can see, I'm sure, that there are implications here for the body, for the church. We are all in Christ. Ideally, all means unity. How have I been, <clears throat> excuse me, processing that word community for years? 
common unity. The body is, according to my own definition, a community. And what is a community? A common unity. Notice the scripture says here that the rock, the consistent thing, the unchanging thing, the foundation, the support, the base is Christ. Right? For they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So the rock here is suggestive of a thing that is unchanging, a thing that is foundation, a thing that you can build on, a thing that you are supported by. Okay? So what is peace? By definition, peace can be a state of harmony or peace can be the absence of hostility. Peace is used to describe the cessation of violent conflict. Peace can mean a state of quiet or tranquility or an absence of disturbance or agitation. Peace can also describe a relationship between any people characterized by respect, justice, and goodwill. Peace can describe calm, serenity, and silence. Now, that latter understanding of peace can also pertain to an individual's sense of himself or herself as to be at peace in one's own mind. Think about all the ways we use this word, peace, a state of tranquility or quiet, a state of security or order within a community provided for by law or custom, peace, peace, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Peace, harmony in personal relations. Peace, a state or period of mutual concord between governments. Peace, a pact or agreement to end hostilities between those who have been at war or in a state of enmity. Peace, used interjectionally to ask for silence or calm or as a greeting or a farewell. Peace, in a state of concord or tranquility. Notice that peace is both an individual and a communal state. Notice that peace is both an individual and a communal state. Keep in mind that the devil does not want you to have peace. Your enemy does not want you to have peace. Why? Because Romans 14, 17 says peace is part of the kingdom. Why? Because Luke 12, 32 says it's God's good pleasure to give it to you. It's a gift. Isaiah 54, 17 says it's your heritage. John 14, 27 says that Jesus left it as a gift. According to the psalmist, peace is proof of the kingdom. Psalm 133 starts out how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For brethren to dwell together at peace. When you're in peace, you can think clearly. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. When you're in peace, you can hear and understand clearly. 1 Corinthians 14, 30 to 33. According to Paul in the book of Romans, peace crushes Satan and his plans. According to Isaiah, peace is one of the names of God. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is the prince of peace, Jesus says. So Satan understands the power of peace, which is why it is also the cornerstone of some false religions. Think about it. The Scientologists take you through this whole process to get clear, right? The Hindus, the Hare Krishnas, and the Buddhists seek oneness or bliss, inner peace or nirvana. 
what all of the false religions tell you is that you must work to it. What all the false religions tell you that you have to work to achieve, God gives you, Christian, freely. So while it's not your job to attain it because it is a gift, it is your job to maintain it. And we're going to talk about that this evening. So again, the false religions, the, 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 the religions inspired by the evil one, all make you think that you have to do work in order to get peace, when peace is a gift of God. The scripture even says that rest, he gives rest to his loved ones, right? This is, this is a gift of God. So it is not for us to obtain, it is for us to maintain. This is especially important in the hectic time that we live in, in the hectic world that we live in, because when peace is present, there's no room for stress and confusion. When peace is present, you can think clearly, you can hear from God, you can discern. All the things that we need, the things that we need to be equipped with in order to walk through this life. Isaiah 26, 3 to 7. Isaiah 26, 3 to 7. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace because it is trusting in you. Again, you will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace for it is trusting in you. Trust in the Lord forever because in Yah, the Lord is an everlasting rock. For he has humbled those who live in lofty places, in inaccessible city. He brings it down. He brings it down to the ground. He throws it to the dust. Feet trample it, the feet of the humble, the steps of the poor. Verse 7, the path of the righteous is level. You, meaning God, clear a straight path for the righteous. So look at verse three again. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace for it is trusting in you. And then look at the promise for you, child of God. Verse seven, the path of the righteous is level. You clear a straight path for the righteous. So now the question needs to be asked. Verse five talks about lofty places. King James calls them lofty things. What are your lofty things? What is your lofty city? What is something that you are dealing with in your life that God needs to tear down so that you can have peace? What are the things in your life that God needs to destroy so that you can walk on a straight and level path? Is it a person? Is it a place? Is it a goal, an objective? Is it a job? Is it an aspiration? What does God have to lay low in your life in order for you to have peace? And are you willing to let him do it? Because again, peace is a gift. The maintenance of the peace is on you. As Vodi Bakum says, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Amen. Philippians 2, verse 1 to verse 6. Let's, let's think about how to have peace in your mind. Philippians 2, 1 to 6. Philippians 2, 1 to 6. How to have peace in your mind. If then there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only 
for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your attitude that of Jesus Christ, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. This is about peace in the body, but it's also about, about peace in the individual. Look at what he's saying here. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by doing what? Thinking the same way. Unity. Having the same love. Unity. Sharing the same feelings. Unity. Focusing on one goal. Unity. What do we know about unity? Where there is unity, there is strength. Where there is unity, there is peace. He doubles down on the point by saying, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Why? Because you're part of the body. You're part of this community, this common unity, which is a place of strength and a place of peace. And then he gives us the best possible example by saying, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. He goes on to say that what did he do? What did Jesus do? He humbled himself. The old hymn says he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me, right? If the greatest one to ever exist humbled himself. It's funny, I've had this conversation a couple of times today. He walked in the midst of his creation. He, each person he looked at, he knew them through and through, up and down, left and right, knew them better than they knew themselves. And yet he chose to love them. He chose to humble himself, to submit himself, to subjugate himself, to lower himself so that we, as we'll see in Romans 5, can have peace with God, so that we can have community, common unity, so that we can have peace with one another, so that we can have within ourselves, because it is a gift, peace in ourselves. So peace in yourself, peace in the community, peace with God. It's a multi-tiered thing. David understood it when he wrote Psalm 23. He understood it. He said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And then he says, King James says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. The Christian Standard Bible translates it this way, only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What an amazing promise. That is a promise of peace now and later. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the implication of these scriptures is that competition, greed, and jealousy are all enemies of peace, both personal and communal. And that God has already covered you himself. So why be covetous of others? Covetousness, jealousy, and competitiveness are all the enemies of peace. You go to bed jealous of somebody else, you don't rest. You're thinking about what that other person has that you wish you had. You can't get any peace. 
You're covering that person's things. When you see them, you're not going to be at peace with them. And because covetousness is sinfulness, you won't be at peace with God. So you will destroy all the three tiers of peace by being jealous, being being covetous. And I'm not talking about competitiveness as in that good kind of competition where we encourage one another unto good works like, like the, the scripture talks about. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I want to do better than you because I'm competing because I think I'm better than you. That's a whole other thing. So the same way as we just understood that God gives us a three-tiered peace, right? Peace in ourselves, peace with our brothers and sisters, and peace with God. Our sin destroys all three of those tiers. T-I-E-R-S, not T-E-A-R-S, T-I-E-R-S. Now, going back to 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, and all did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So what kind of mindset do we have to have? Let's go to Philippians 4. Let's read verse 4 to verse 13. Philippians 4, 4 to 13. Philippians 4, 4 to 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, Through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Is Paul saying the exact same thing that Isaiah said centuries before? When Isaiah said, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Centuries later, the same spirit prompts Paul to write that the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, mind, right, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And then he gives them a formula to put into, to play, to get it done. How? Do we keep our minds and our hearts guarded? How do we do that? Here, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's any praise, dwell on those things. To dwell means to live in. To dwell means to take up residence, right? To dwell means that you're fixing to stay. Dwell on these things, focus on these things, ruminate on these things. Be like the cow that has, you know, cows have four stomachs, right? They chew, they bring it back up, they chew it some more. They bring it back up, they chew it some more. The things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, things that are of moral excellence. If there's any praise, dwell, ruminate on these things. Do what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Notice how Paul goes from talking to them about their care for him to giving them another huge piece, P-I-E-C-E, of the peace, P-E-A-C-E, equation. I have learned to be content in whatever 
circumstances I am. I know how both to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. Verse 13, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. All these people with Philippians 4.13, on their arms and in the, you know, they, they, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, have taken this verse out of context. What is the context? How to have peace. Whether I'm low or high, whether I'm in or out, whether it's good or bad, I have learned how to be content. How? Because I dwell on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any moral excellence and if there's any praise, I dwell on those things. I live in that place. And because I live in that place, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me and all things being, I can be hungry, I can be well fed, I can abase, I can abound, it doesn't matter to me because I'm focused on him. So the circumstances don't mess me up. Remember how we were talking about how joy and happiness are two different things. You can still have joy and be unhappy. Right? That's what's going on here. Hallelujah, Lord. I, I love those times when you're working on something, you're looking, you're working on something to prepare it. And, and you know, some things, it, it's just different in the moment. It just hits a different way. I am so warm right now. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. So peace in the body. Well, before we go on, does anybody have any questions, any comments, anything before we go on to the next place here? Um, I have one question. Is there a distinction between peace and rest? Peace can be a part of your body situation and your mind situation. When your mind is at rest, it's at peace. When your body's at rest, it's at peace. Right? So in terms of rest being a physical function, yes, peace and rest can be used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Okay. How would is that, it achieved? I'm sorry. No, would that um, resting be in Christ? That's where the peace comes out of? Very definitely. Because, because remember that you're constantly in a state of being tested, right? As we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Nehemiah and how they had to build the wall with their armor on, right? You always have to stay in a state of readiness as a Christian. But he's also saying that you are promised peace. And that peace, even while you are guarding your house and your land, that peace will guard your heart, your heart and your mind. Okay, so you can be tired in a sense and still have peace. Okay. Yeah, I, I did have a either a question or a comment uh, to the last. Uh, Go for it, bro. Uh, slide that you had, uh, which covered peace, lovely. All of everything you said was great. But um, the last one, just want to make sure that I understand that you're saying that just like you can have uh, last week's teaching on joy and uh, and be unhappy, this you're saying that you can have situations that are very trying and testing and even troublesome and still uh, have a blanket of peace. Yes, uh, provided. sir. That's yes, the pastor's sir. understanding. Okay, thank you. I think I think I could give a testimonial. Two test, two examples of a testimony of having peace, even in the midst of turmoil. Um, one was in the, when I was in the military, uh, enduring things that I thought I couldn't physically do, 
but knowing that I wasn't alone while I was enduring it, it gave me peace. And it gave me the, the strength to endure those things. And it pulled me out on the other side to be a better person. Um, a second example is um, a few years ago, my son was, uh, was on a respirator. He was intubated he had, and he was away at college. And as I'm driving up there, I get a call from the doctor and she asked me if I couldn't get there any quicker, can I fly? Because she didn't have the belief that he would make it through that night. And I tell you, I was washed in peace. And it was like the most reassuring feeling that came over me that, that just said, and all I heard was, I got this. I got this. That's what verse I, seven says, bro. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And when I got there, he was, you know, in a bad shape. But uh, three days later, four days later, we got him off that vent. And, you know, that's the first time that I really understood the meaning of peace that passes all understanding. Peace when everyone around you is, is, uh, is losing their, their head. And you're sitting there calm, like if the like if the like if the ocean, the waves are just stopped for you. Like it's raining on everybody, but you're not getting wet. <laughs> I mean, that's the only you know mm -hmm. two examples of it. Amen. But I also, when I pray, I I pray to be able, Lord, help me to rest in you, so I can have peace. It's kind of like a, a, a prerequisite for me, right? I need to be able to rest in you, Lord, because the rest is what will give me peace. So I, I think you need to make verse eight part of your day to day. Mm -hmm. Okay, that whole concept of dwelling on something is, mm -hmm. is sitting in a place and staying there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's definitely gonna help rest and you know being able to rest in god is the idea of having the assurance that he is always there he jesus made some very real promises that we can stand on and trust in but in terms of the day to day you know the transformation that comes by the renewing of our minds which scripture talks about happens by what we put in right and what where we choose to to sit and we're going to get there too thank you brothers how do we achieve peace in your body how do you achieve peace in the body romans 12 1 to 6 romans 12 1 to 6 therefore brothers by the mercy of god i urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to god this is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Let's stop there for a second. I hope none of you think as I used to think, as I heard off of a pulpit, that the word of God has three levels, that there is the good, there is the pleasing, and the perfect and so the good meaning that there are things that you do in God's will, but he'll wink at some of your sin. The pleasing is the things you do that please God, but you know, you still have some leeway. And then the perfect is when you're right in tune with everything God is doing. No, God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. What is Paul saying here? He's already established that if you are in Christ, if you read the book of Romans, you kind of see that by the time he reaches chapter 12. I'm sorry, Janet, go ahead. Oh, it's just, no, go ahead. By the I'm time sorry. you hit chapter 12, you, you fully understand the nature of sin. You understand why you are in Christ. You understand that it is God's will and God's will alone that has you in the position that you're in. All of that, I will mercy who I mercy, right? 
all of that by the time you get here. So what is he saying to these people who he has basically said, once you're in Christ, you are a slave to Christ. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Die daily. Your sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God, and this is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this age, this stuff that's going on, the things that you see around you, the things that you encounter, the wickedness of this current generation that we are in. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And then he goes to community. After he has dealt with the individual, right? He goes to community. He says, for by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, verse four, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Verse six, according to the grace given to us, we have different gifts, okay? And then he goes on to talk about the gifts. But what is the point here? There is how you stay in individual peace, which is by sacrificing your will and your desires and your wants for what God's will is for you. by rebuking and turning away from the wickedness of the current age, all the temptations, you know, and we, we are in an age and a time where anything that anybody thinks might be good is okay to do. And so we see some of the most ridiculously perverse things now. But what is he saying? You be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what God's will is and how you should walk in the world, okay? And then he goes to the community. This is how understanding that we all have a, a wide variety of gifts and different levels of faith be cognizant of the others so that the community really is a common unity. Remember that we communicate three ways, by word, by gesture, and spirit. Acknowledging that is understanding. Being willing to accept responsibility for yourself is maturity. The way that you walk in the world, understanding that you communicate on several levels and in several ways is just that, understanding. But being willing to accept responsibility for yourself as you walk in the world is maturity. And we are not a group of people who should be on at this stage of our lives and our walk with Christ. We shouldn't be on milk anymore. We need to be on meat, okay? Everybody here knows how pearls are made, right? Does anybody, better yet, does anybody not know how pearls are made? Yes. Okay, so, so you, all right, what happens is an irritant, whether intentional or accidental, is introduced into the body of a clam. And the clam starts to emit proteins which surround the irritant in order to keep it from irritating the soft flesh of the clam. And it keeps secreting these proteins, which circle around this irritant, and they get bigger and bigger to the point where we have a pearl. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I want you to keep that in mind, because the deal is this. Sin is an irritant. James 1, 12 to 15. Okay. Let me finish this thought. Sin is an irritant. Okay? The church is making pearls. God wants gold. Uh -huh. What do I mean? 
James 1, 12 to 15. A man who endures trials is blessed because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. But God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So death is the grandchild of desire with sin in the middle. Where you just read? James 1, 12 to 15. Uh, James. James 1, okay. 12 to 15. Desire or lust, after it has conceived, desire gets pregnant, gives birth to sin. And sin is birthed and grows up. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Malachi 3, 2 and 3. But who can endure or who shall abide, as King James says? Who can endure the day of his coming? And who will stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like a cleansing lye, or as King James says, like the fuller's soap. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. My assertion here is that the church today is making pearls. It is teaching you how to secrete protein to cover the irritant. But God wants gold. How is gold refined? With fire. You all remember the fairy tale of the princess and the pea, right? The princess, they're trying to make sure that she's a real princess, so they put her in a bed with like 50 mattresses and they put a pea like a little green pea at the bottom, underneath the bottom mattress. And she's a real princess, they find out, because that little pea, even under all those mattresses, upset her delicate, her delicate constitution and she couldn't get any rest. Well, like that fairy tale, sin in your life causes discomfort and it causes the inability to rest. And while our first response, instead of necessarily dealing with the sin, is to cover it over and make pearls, God wants it out of your life. So as the old song says, you can come forth like pure gold. And the benefit is that because we understand that sin destroys all three tiers of peace, getting that sin out of your life will keep those three tiers, peace in yourself, peace in your community with your brethren and peace with God intact. I heard a preacher say one time, we have given up dying for dancing meaning that we no longer want to endure the process of purification. We only want to be blessed and shout and dance. And this is a major reason why we have no peace. Colossians 2, 8 to 14. Colossians 2, 8 to 14. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world and not based on Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ and you have been filled by him. 
who is the head over every ruler and authority. Verse 11, you were also circumcised with him with a circumcision not done by hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of the Messiah. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, and when you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave all of our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Meaning that peace equals reconciliation. And in order for reconciliation, something has to die in that the Prince of Peace reconciled us to God. He made peace with God on our behalf via the cross. So for us in the day-to-day, what does this mean? It means a crucified life leads to peace with God. But you see, today, no one wants to die to self in order to dine. Nobody wants to decline to self so that they can recline, get rest. It wasn't until Saul of Tarsus got knocked off his high horse that he became somebody. It wasn't until Saul of Tarsus got knocked off his high horse that he became somebody. He thought he was somebody. But once God got to him, once Jesus laid him low and raised him up, he became somebody. But that's uncomfortable for us today. That doesn't fill up the pews. That doesn't fill up the offering plates. But God's goal is to fill you up so that you can go forth. And as the scripture says, because you know you're God, you're able to do exploits. Hallelujah. All of those who are led by God's spirit are God's sons. And sons, meaning sons and daughters. Romans 8, 8 to 14. Romans 8, 8 to 14, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since the spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Verse 10, now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those who who are led by God's spirit are God's sons. Why are we talking about this? Because this is one of the ways that you maintain peace. You deny yourself, you take up your cross. You maintain peace by living in a way that glorifies God and edifies your brothers and sisters. You, You dwell on the things that are going to bring transformation to your mind. This is how you maintain this peace. Because remember, peace is a gift. It is something that God gives you. It is your job to maintain it. So my goal tonight is to give you tools to maintain your peace as you walk in the world. Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. 
Ephesians 2, 4 to 10, for we are his creation created in Christ Jesus for good works. Ephesians 2, 4 to 10, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Verse 6, together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no man can boast, for we are his creation. King James says we are his workmanship. And I love that because workmanship gives the, the sense of someone taking their hands and fashioning and shaping and pounding and molding and heating and doing what needs to be done to shape this thing into the image that you want. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. What is this saying? God made you uniquely you. And he did not do this without a purpose. You have a purpose that God created you for. And he placed you, as we've talked about before, you have been placed in the timeline of eternity right now for such a time as this. You're here because he wants you here. You're dealing with what you're dealing with because he is refining you so that you will be pure like the purest gold. That's why you're here. There is work for you to do, okay? The whole thing about being a a holy nation, a royal priesthood, all of that, all of that. But right now, the point is your peace. Think about what that does for your self-esteem. And I'm not talking about making you braggadocious or, or arrogant or anything like that. But if your mind is consumed with wonder about who am I, what am I here for, blah, 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 all the things that make people berserk in this current age you have the pleasure the treasure the privilege of knowing that god himself made you unique and that you were created in christ jesus for good works and not just any good works specific things that god prepared ahead of time that you could walk in them Very sad song when we were kids. A woman said, when I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what should I be? And what was mother's response? Que sera, sera. What would be, will be. What terrible advice to give a little child. I don't know what you're going to be. You were created unto good works that God has before ordained ahead of time that you can walk in them. That should give you peace. Even as you dwell on whatsoever things are good, right? So how do we foster peace? How does it work in the outpouring of our day to day? One, have a healthy self image, but don't think more highly of yourself. He read in Romans 12 to me. Two, judge every situation through the mind of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 16. Number three, know that Jesus' own peace is for you. So don't be afraid. John 14, 25 to 27. Think on the things that we talked about earlier. Dwell on those things. Choose to see the best things. 
Number five, pay attention to how you live. We're going to read Ephesians 5, 5 to 20. And number six, stay focused on God. As we read earlier in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Ephesians 5, 5 to 20, pay attention to how you live. And we're going to pull that up. And I think that will be the last scripture that we cover this evening. If you're hearing a dog barking, you are really hearing a dog barking. My nephew, Rusty, is here with my sister. Rusty is my sister's dog. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 5, 5 to 20. But yeah, you know what? Let's let's read the Okay, let's start from verse one. You should be able to see. Yep. Ephesians 5, let's start at verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 20, and we'll end with this. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love, as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Doesn't that sound like Romans 12, about presenting your body as a living sacrifice? Okay, same premise here. Do what God did as his children. Imitate your daddy. Walk in love. As the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Verse three, but sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for saints. Coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather give thanks. For no one recognizes this. Every sexual, sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah and of God. I love how Paul continually makes the case that your personal conduct reflects on you and also reflects on your community. Your personal conduct not only impacts you, it impacts the entire community. Verse six, let no one deceive you with empty arguments for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners for you were once darkness. But now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light results in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. You hear that, righteous one? Verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light results in what? Goodness, righteousness, and truth, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made clear, for what makes everything clear is light. Therefore, as it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. Verse 15. Again, we're talking about peace, that three-tiered peace in yourself, in your community, and with God. Pay careful attention then, verse 15, to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is and don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, 
hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music from your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Giving instructions for the individual, giving instructions for the community. As the individual obeys, as the individual chooses to obey, the individual then brings that obedience and that peace that they have within themselves to bear on the community. As the community operates as a common unity, that peace spreads throughout the community. And at the core of all of this is Romans 5.1. It says that because of Jesus' sacrifice, you have peace with God. Therefore, Romans 5.1, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, we have also attained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse three, and not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That was a lot in a little bit of time, but I hope it was helpful. I do have the notes. If anybody wants them, I'm willing to share. I am so full right now. God, I just thank you. I give you glory. And that's all I've got. Um, questions, comments, the floor is open. Um, all through this, um, I just, I don't know, I just kept thinking about 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it's it's the verse that, that's always misquoted, drives me crazy, you know, when people say God will never give you more than you can handle, but the actual verse, no temptation is overtaking you, that is not common to man, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with that temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That that whole passage, I never saw it like until now about that. That gives peace. It's like I can rest in knowing that even though sin surrounds me and the enemy surrounds me and and my flesh and all of it, God has given me a way. He's given me a peace to say, "No, you're going to get through this." Amen. You can get through this. And that's, but if that's not peace, what, what is peace? Amen. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for your diligence, uh, uh, time and study, uh, and exhausting the topic, uh, or the understanding of peace, I should say, um, seeing it from all the different ver uh, angles. Um, um, yeah, learned stuff today or uh, that I didn't see before. So thank Amen. you for that. Amen. Okay. Yeah, I'd just like to say real quick, good teachings as always, brother, and you have an uncanny knack for uh, being right on topic with where I'm at. I don't know how you do it every week. It is, it is the spirit of God, brother. It, yeah, and it's moving in you tonight. Very powerful, and I thank you. Hallelujah. All right, whoever wants to pray, the floor is open. I'll close this out. All right, thanks, Jay. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We thank you for another Bible study so well put together, so thoughtful, and even so full of truth 
so full of your spirit, O oh Lord God. Thank you that we can come to this table every Monday night and be well fed, O oh Lord God. Thank you for Cyril, continue to bless him, continue to bless his family, protect him, provide for him, and continue to give him wisdom and comfort in all the things that he must face. Thank you, O Lord God, for tonight's topic of peace. Lord God, we, we know more than anyone else that the world is trying to get this, and the world is trying to get it in the wrong places and in the wrong ways. But you, O oh Lord Jesus, you're called the Prince of Peace, and you are Jehovah Shalom. Thank you. So we thank you, O oh Lord God, that you are our peace. And I pray for everyone on the call tonight that your peace will fill their hearts. It will surround their physical beings. It will inform their eyes and their minds as to every situation that they face that you are with them and that your peace cannot be taken from them, O oh Lord God. So I just thank you for doing that right now, O oh Lord God, for each and every one of us here. And I give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Love you all. Next week, we are going to handle righteousness since we already handled joy and peace righteousness is next monday god willing um god bless you all